You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hi, I'm Michael Goodfriend, executive producer of the Play On Podcast series at Next Chapter Podcasts. Katie and Nathan wanted me to let you know that they use strong language on their show. So if you don't like that, this isn't the show for you. And you should come directly over to Next Chapter Podcasts and see podcasts.com to hear the play on Shakespeare podcasts because Shakespeare doesn't use swear words. Shakespeare only uses antiquated old words, which we've translated into modern English so that they won't offend you. Words like bunghole, which is translated to hole, or fut, which means fuck or C-U-N-T, which we respell as P-U-S-Y. I promise you, you won't be offended. And you're going to love our show. It's safe. It's Shakespeare. They don't fucking swear. Hi, this is Katie. And this is Nathan. And you're listening to Queen's Podcast, the show about badass women in history. Bofert, 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 Bofert. Are you broke? Are you okay? <laughs> Sorry, we're on repeat. Um, it's the new Alicia Keys album. Bofert, Bofert, <laughs> the the Bofert, record was Bofert. skipping. Sorry about that. <laughs> How are you, Nathan? I'm good. How are you, Katie? I'm okay. You know, it's been a long time since I've seen you. Um. It, it, it's funny because I was literally at his house like, yeah, 20, 30 minutes ago because he's watching my dog when I'm out of town. So we came over for a puppy play date. Um, also super excited about this new content that we have for you guys. Yes! Um, this newest lady might so happen be the first tutor that we know of. Maybe? Yeah. Well, the first, um, she definitely <laughs> has a hand in the Tudor dynasty, like starting the Tudor dynasty, which I know you nerds are real into. We got a bunch of Tudor files that listen to this uh, podcast, so I am really excited. Nathan, rip the Band-Aid off. Just let us know. The suspense is killing me. Who are we talking about today? Everybody, welcome to the stage. Maggie B. That's Maggie Margaret B. Beaufort. If you Beaufort, nasty. Beaufort, 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 Beaufort. Margaret Beaufort, yes. So <laughs> why is she so important, Nathan? Because she was the Countess of Richmond, mother of Henry the Seventh, and a huge player in the English Civil War and the War of the Roses. Yes, and you know we love the Wars of the Roses. So speaking of which, Nathan, tell us about this cocktail. The rosé, hey, mimosa. Um, yes. Yes, absolutely. So what I did, guys, I took, <laughs> literally made my own rose water. So I took like three little blossoms of roses, uh-huh. rinsed them off, boiled it with some raspberries, about half a pint, covered that all in water, boiled it for about 30 minutes, strained it. That gave me my beautiful, wonderful raspberry rose water. And then raspberry I mixed that. Raspberry rose water. And that is exactly what happened. I, I put, uh, I, I did a half a glass of champagne, rosé, if you're nasty, and then put in about a shot and a half of that mixture that I made, and then topped it with a little bit of orange juice. Just a little, because the orange juice is super sweet. And there you have it. The, the Wars of the Rosé Mimosa. Mimosa. Yeah. I love it. All right. So before we get started, we have some Patreon shout outs. We only have one today. So big ol' thank you to our supporter, Kristen. Yes, and special shout out to listener named Jordan, just turned 14. So we wanted to say, hey, happy, very happy birthday! birthday. Sorry for everything we say. Sorry yeah, yeah. that we are so inappropriate for 14-year-olds, but it sounds uh, like it sounds like your mom is cool, so... Yeah, so stop listening now because <laughs> we're having D jokes because we're hopping on the D train. <laughs> hopping on the D train, going down to England to talk about Maggie B. Anyway, happy birthday. Happy birthday, Jordan. <laughs> yes, happy birthday. So, Katie, when yes. was our Maggie B born? She was likely, we think we know her birthday. She was likely born on May 31st, 
1443. So if that is accurate, Nathan, she's one of you. She's a Gemini. Yes. Social butterfly. Loves it. Wants to have a good time. However, a little bit distant. Needs a little space. Just has to have a little, you know, lovely time. Um, But she was likely born in Bledstow Castle, which is in Bedfordshire, England, about 60 miles north of London. And she is born to that bougie mother of family girl. Yes. Like, her, like bougie, 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 bougie. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I want to take a shower and be like, bougie, 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 bougie. <laughs> Let that bougie rain all over you, Maggie. Her family's not officially royalty, but they are close as hell. Regal okay. as fuck is what we're getting at. So let's talk about this Regal as family. So yes. longtime listeners of the show probably recognize this last name. Uh, last year we covered Catherine Swinford and she was the mistress and eventual wife of John of Gaunt. And John of Gaunt was the son of a king and one of the most powerful dudes in medieval history, in case you didn't know. Yes, yes. Catherine Swinford. You should go back and listen to that episode if you haven't, because if you're interested in this time period, I mean, Catherine Swinford and John of Gaunt were kind of like the, they started it, you know, they started, they made all these people um, that we're going to talk about, basically. Uh, so Catherine Swinford and John of Gaunt, their kids were illegitimate at birth. Well, they gave all of their kids the last name Beaufort, since they couldn't take John of Gaunt's actual name. Uh, but later, the Beaufort kids were all legitimized. But with, like, a little asterisk, a little caveat. Yeah. They can't ever be kings. They can't ever actually be in line of succession. Yeah. So Catherine Swinford is Margaret Beaufort's great-grandmother. And the Beaufort kids, while not in the line of succession, most of them were still pretty close to their royal cousins. They had a good relationship with them, Mm -hmm. held high ranks. They had the good offices and titles, you know, all that and all that jazz. All that jazz. Still very (laughs) influential people in the government of England at the time. Her dad's name was John Beaufort, and he had the title of Duke of Somerset. And so she's she's the daughter of a duke. She's half cousin to the king. Like we said, showering and bougie. Do it, Nathan. Bougie, 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 bougie. Bougie, bougie, bougie. Shower <laughs> with bougie. <laughs> <laughs> so her mom's name was also named Margaret. Yes. <laughs> Why not? Yeah. Why not? Why not? <laughs> so her mom, Beauchamp, was very wealthy heiress. Uh, lots of lands, lots of castles, which, I mean... Bougie, 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 bougie. <laughs> So what we're getting at is she is set up for success. From day uh, one. She's got day it one. the get-go. Right. Yeah. yeah. So connected family, lots of money. She's looking good. Looking good. However, Maggie didn't get to know her dad because he died when she was less than one year old. And it was a controversy, and it's still a bit of a mystery. So let's go down rabbit hole number one in this series. I spent so much time reading about her dad. So the first thing you need to know is her dad may have suffered from some depression or some PTSD. This isn't something you're going to see in contemporary reports because they didn't understand shit like that back then. But it's just a wild guess we're making based on the everything of the story we're about to tell. Mm -hmm. And here's why. So, first of all, he became the heir to the title of Duke after his older brother died very, very young. So, I mean, it's nice getting a title and money and respect. But when someone in your immediate family is dead because of it, therapy, yeah, not good. And so this was in the Hundred Years' War, which was actually 116 years, but whatever. (laughs) Basically, this was a time, uh, like a long war in between uh, England and France. And basically, every family in England was affected by it and lost men, brothers, sons, whatever, in it. And so he's not, he's no different. All his close male relatives and friends died young in battle of the wars of the roses and 
And then when John Beaufort was in his early 20s, him and his younger brother were captured while fighting in France. And he was imprisoned for 17 years. One seven. Almost two decades. I struggled so much to find more information about his imprisonment and there's it's just not out there uh, uh, 17 years nathan can you imagine can you imagine no i could not <clears throat> and we've done research on this where royal prisoners are generally treated pretty well yeah um, there's a few exceptions we don't usually see like a duke held in a dungeon for 17 years right but- like when we've talked about like mary queen of scots she was treated well during her imprisonment yeah. And we talked about who else? Joan of Navarre. You know, she was treated well in her imprisonment. So we have to assume that it was the standard to not torture a duke while he's in prison. But, like, yeah, we just don't know. That's such a long time. That's a really long time. And his family couldn't afford to bail him out. And his his cousin, the king probably could have afforded but they just didn't and oh, gosh. he had to wait for his family like his mom to like be able to pull up the resources to ransom him so like that probably really fucking sucked wasn't a good feeling to be like i'm out here fighting for my cousin the king and he won't ransom me you know yeah oh like he's probably spent that 17 years contemplating how disposable he was so that's why I'm saying it's probably not a long shot that he had some depression and PTSD. 17 years. <laughs> yeah, right. Anyway, soon after his release, he was given a wealthy heiress to marry. And we don't know if Margaret's parents' marriage was happy or not, but spoiler alert, it was short. Short. And and John Beaufort was sent to war dicking like right after the wedding. And they probably... Probably didn't spend enough time together to know, you know, do they really get along? Not really. Eh. They spent enough time together to get pregnant, but that was about it. Side note, I just don't know where else to put this. Uh, Margaret's mom. So, Mama Margaret, this is her second marriage. She has seven children from her first marriage. Seven. So, baby number eight for her. And while Mm. none of the... There doesn't seem to be a whole lot of information... On, like, if really Margaret's, like, early, early childhood. But later records in her life indicate that she gave a lot of favors and a lot of money and stuff like that to her half-siblings from her mom's first marriage. So I have to imagine, I, I think that's kind of nice to know that she had a big household full of people around whenever she was young. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah, she she, so, she she had a lot of brothers and sisters, which I feel like I've never hey, heard about before in any Margaret Beaufort bi- biography. Not long before Margaret was born, her dad was put back into the military to lead troops in the 116 years war. 100 years 100, war. Just, 116. It's just not as snappy. Like 100 years. It, 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 puts a, it puts an image in your head. Yeah. And <laughs> a huge, huge sweeping summarization of this entire war dicking situation is dad is not good at leading Mm -hmm. troops. And Mm -hmm. in 1443, the year Margaret was born, her dad led this military unit into a disaster situation. Yeah. Uh, He came back home to England, and he was literally, at this moment, the laughing stock. You know, it was like, oh, you lost that war-dicking situation over yonder. Ha ha ha. Over yonder, it was a direct quote. Um, It was bad. It was such a disastrous fuck up on his part. It just gets... So yeah, but he comes back and he is just persona non grata. Like, no... look at that SAT word. I went to college. It was not a great one, but I went to one. Uh, (laughs) Nathan went to the same college, so... Um, Yeah. Hey. Hey. Um, But no, he was just like a social pariah. It was just like, he fucked up so bad. And then before Margaret's first birthday, her dad was dead. And the scandal is, is that a lot of people believe that he committed suicide. Ooh, in the Catholic faith, that's very, very bad. That's like, shame, shame. I feel like in some podcasts we've talked, like when we talk about like ancient Rome, 
like the ancient times, I feel like a lot of like suicide was a lot more common. Intentional. It, well, it was yeah, intentional. It was um it was a lot more common in some, but like in this in medieval Christian society, it was um yeah. first you were going to hell, but then also it kind of like cast a nasty look on your entire family as well. It wasn't just you. Yeah. So we don't hear about it a lot. If it was suicide, which really given everything about this guy's life, I'm not I, I wouldn't be completely surprised. PTSD. Um, it's PTSD. PTSD. Well, also his his colossal fuck up in the 116 years war. We just say 100 years war. He was gonna eventually be put on trial for like what he did, like how bad he fucked it up. And so like it also is looked at maybe he was saving his family from even further humiliation with um, like an upcoming trial. But either way, Margaret would have been told her whole life that definitely he didn't commit suicide. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I, there's no way to know if the Beaufort family, you know, was just covering up or it it was also the 1400s. So maybe he just got a paper cut and died. You know, we don't. We'll never know. Also, yeah. So it's it, it's possible that he got a paper cut and died. Um, yeah. He could have, you know, died of some illness and. His enemies ended up spreading this rumor about him because there's this family called the Yorks. And, Maybe you've heard of them. Uh, yeah, the Duke of York uh, hates the Duke of Somerset. We'll never know. Yeah. But we'll never know. what we do know is that Maggie wouldn't remember her dad at all. So she kind of yeah. just like dropped it. Yeah, she wasn't even one yet. So she just knew what people told her about him. So... Now her dad's dead, and if she would have been a boy, she would now be the Duke of Somerset. But sexism. She has ovaries, and she can't think for herself. That uterus, that uterus is just floating around. It's a little bit of tiny ovaries because she's just a little bit baby. But uh, yeah, no, you're right. She, so she should have been the Duchess of Somerset when her dad died, but instead the title went to her uncle. But she is, regardless, still a very, very, very wealthy heiress. She yeah. is all of one, barely. And she's like the most, one of the most eligible bachelorettes in the country, if not Europe altogether. At the ripe old age of one. At the, can you imagine <laughs> the TV show Bachelorette <laughs> with a one year old? Like, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> She just oh, herself. She just um, <laughs> someone <laughs> someone changed change the bachelorette. Future bride. Here you go. <laughs> like, what the hell? <laughs> yeah. But at least I mean, at least she was a child bride to another infant. So yeah. maybe that's okay. <clears throat> um his name was John de la Pole, uh son of the Duke of Suffolk. So Yeah. Yeah, so in 1444, when she was just one, she was married to this to this other baby. Babies, we've said babies don't need jobs. Babies also don't need marriages. Babies don't need spouses. Babies don't yeah, need jobs. Your, your brain is not developed yet as the, the babies infant of the ripe old age one. Spouses. No. Mm-mm, mm-mm. They yeah, so. Taxes. They don't need mortgages. Babies, Babies don't need any responsibilities because their <laughs> brains aren't formed and they can't talk and they can't ba- babies have a lot of limitations, you know? So we should really, we should really just let them grow up a little bit. Be before getting them married. Yeah. <laughs> but a few years after her quote unquote marriage to the other baby, John de la Pole, the, that family fell from favor. And this is another rabbit hole we could go down, but I, we just didn't have time. The Duke of Suffolk, so the, um, John de Pole's dad, mm-hmm. is exiled. And so he is on a boat to go to his exile in France or whatever, and he's murdered while oh. he's going to his I, exile. The drama. Which I want to see a miniseries about that. That sounds please. interesting. Yes, but we don't, we don't have time for it. Let us know if you want it on Patreon. Anyway, the baby marriage was annulled because the Beauforts are like, well, this isn't advantageous to us anymore. Um, and she's such a hot commodity on the marriage market. And until someone's consummated their marriage, they can't, like, it's not, it's not completely binding. It's she's easy to get an annulment. She's such a hot commodity at she's one. She's such a hot commodity. <laughs> and the king, Henry VI, decided that Margaret would marry his half-brother. <sighs> Took a deep breath there. A guy named Edmund Tudor. <laughs> so yeah. I kind of hate 
that the two are grown ass men discussing the marital situation of an infant, but uh, here we are. And <laughs> this is why a lot of famous historians have said that history is a bag of dicks. Yes, 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 famous, yes. Uh, these two. We still. <laughs> So let's meet King and his half brother, shall we? Yes. <sighs> so we've we've met Henry the Sixth before in our Jaquetta of Luxembourg episode, and maybe a little bit in our Elizabeth Woodville episode. So if you're interested in these times of history, so we've mentioned three of our. If you are brand new to the show, and in between this episode and part two of Margaret Beaufort. you want to learn more from this time. We have two episodes on Jaquetta of Luxembourg. One on Catherine Swinford and one on Elizabeth Woodville that you might find interesting. A lot of common players. But what you need to know is that King Henry VI is now in his late 20s, early 30s. He's been king his entire life. He became king when he was one years old, one year old. And oh, no. so, Nathan, do babies need jobs? No, babies don't need jobs. And we talk about this a lot, guys. Yeah. So when babies are kings, they have no one to look up to. Right. Mm -hmm. They have no aspiration of this is what you should act like. So they just have babies that have jobs. And it's usually not good. It's usually (laughs) not good. We there's been a lot of baby kings that turn into absolute dickheads. And um, while Henry the sixth wasn't he wasn't a bad king necessarily. He wasn't a great one either. And we will get into that. A little bit. Henry's mom was a woman named Catherine of Valois. Uh, she was the daughter of Charles the Sixth of France, and like oh, their yeah. marriage was supposed to end the Hundred Years' War. Yeah, um, we we talked about this in our Lady of, uh, I mean, the Isabeau of Bavaria episode a whole lot. Yeah, yeah, extensively. But when Henry the Sixth dad died, Catherine Valois shocked everyone by starting a relationship with this dude named Owen Tudor, whose job was keeper of the wardrobe. Okay, Nathan, when you hear the phrase keeper of the wardrobe, what do you think that job entails? Um, you're going to keep my garments. You're going to put mothballs in them. You're going to make sure <laughs> that my sparkly shoes are extra sparkly with a little bit of rhinestones on top and, um, <laughs> just a cracked egg in the morning with a little bit of a mimosa, salt, pepper, a little bit of dill. Thank you. <laughs> Ooh, dill. You put dill in your eggs? That sounds oh, good. So I've, delicious. I have never... I have dill in my cabinet. I think I'm going to have to put dill in my next omelet. That sounds great. Oh. 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 oh, Anyway. Call me when you do. (laughs) I will. Anyway. So that's... Yeah. When I read Keeper of the Wardrobe, I just assumed... What? What? Like, making sure she's got the best dresses? Like, making sure she's got the best... Yeah. All her clothes have been pressed or something? No. It actually... It basically means he managed her estate. Like, he made sure... Right. Or or like he hires the, the bookkeeper. He hires yeah, the lady in waiting. Like the the financial guy. He's just kind of running the show. So I thought that was so interesting because I've heard the story before of how Catherine Valois married her um keeper of her wardrobe and I just assumed that that was like a really low ranking title. But it's actually a really like high up there job for someone working in the household of a queen. Well, as a queen, you would think her wardrobe is probably the most expensive thing there. Therefore, yeah. he calls the shots for... Okay, yeah. so we're yeah. digressing, but progress. Anyway. Ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> um. <laughs> Did you just say we're digressing, but progressing? Yes. I like yes, that. We've I like got that. Beautiful gowns. Beautiful gowns. Beautiful um. gowns. A bougie, 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 bougie. <laughs> So it's still not even clear if Catherine married Owen Tudor or just had babies on babies on babies with him. Yeah. So babies on babies on babies means two sons. I mean, it's over-exaggerating. Imagine that. So Owen and Edmund Tudor were the ones that survived. And y'all, these babies are a scandal. Scandal. But they were the king's only siblings. When you've only got two siblings and you don't know, like, he didn't know a whole lot of his family. So he's got these two little half brothers and he loves them. And so that's how he ended up getting Margaret engaged to 
Edmund Tudor, he just wanted to do his only, he's got two brothers, like his only family in the world that he knows. He wants to do them a solid. And it's like, I'm going to hook you up. I know this really rich baby <laughs> that I'm going to hook you up with. <laughs> <laughs> So, oh, there's something I hoped I'd never have to say out loud. I'm going to hook you up with this oh, rich God. baby. What the fuck? <laughs> no, no, please don't. Oh. <laughs> so the way Margaret tells the story of finding out about her engagement to Edmund Tudor, she's, he's, excuse me, 12 years older than her. <laughs> no big deal. So mm-hmm. she's like nine years old. She and her mother are summoned to the court by the king. And Henry VI asks her to make a couple of public you know, confirmations. First of all, he was like, do you recognize your first marriage to Jean de la Pole? And <laughs> she was like, Jean de la Pole? I do not know. Uh, no. D- direct quote. <laughs> I don't know him. Je ne sais pas Jean de la Pole. <laughs> She's never heard of him. Never heard of that guy. She's do not, not know who you're him. talking that about. Was like when she was wh- one years old. Like, yeah. come on. And, then he's like, do you consent to marry my half-brother, Edmund Tudor? And she was like, oh, halfway there. Oh, I'm living on a prayer. Like, so she, she lives on a prayer for a couple of days. Like, what, what Nathan is trying to say is that she was like, can I pray on it for a couple of days? But Nathan Bon Jovi over here is living on a prayer. <laughs> and and King Henry at the time is like, yeah, go ahead, Bon Jovi. Live on that prayer. <laughs> go pray your little, your nine-year-old little fucking heart out, Margaret Bon Jovi. Which is what I'm going to call her for the rest of this episode. No, I'm not. But... Maggie Bon Jovi. <laughs> so. You can't take us anywhere. <laughs> you know what? We are a liability. <laughs> and... <laughs> What were you doing at nine years old, Nathan? Was m- marriage negotiations any part of your day to day? I know. Uh, no, not marriage negotiations. Probably playing in the sandbox and yeah. having monster trucks and screaming at people how I want to put on a dress. At nine, I was really into tap dancing. Um, um, yeah. Oh, uh, I was. Oh, in- were you Fred Astaire. Yes. Um, Gene Kelly, actually, more. Oh, Gene Kelly seems like a, a, a home run. I was really into tap dancing and making my entire family miserable with all my practicing of tap dancing. Um, no one was talking about marrying me off to a guy in his 20s. Thank God. Yeah, not at nine years mm-hmm. old. She mm-hmm. is nine Nine. <laughs> so now we've talked about one or two other women around this time that are married at really young ages like that. But technically, technically, you are allowed to reject a marriage once you hit a majority. What's, uh, what, uh, Katie, what's behind curtain number two? (laughs) What does majority mean? What does majority age mean? The age of consent for a woman, let me say that again, an age of consent for a girl at the time was 12 years old. Uh, uh, Hashtag uh, I hate it here. Uh, 12 years old. I'm trying. I'm trying now, at 12, well. I wasn't doing tap dancing anymore. I was really into the band Hanson at 12. But still, again, no one was like, who are you going to marry? Like that. Yeah, well, yeah. I guess I, I would have said Taylor Hanson. Old, I, was, um, I was in the math club, and I was doing head of math. Of course you were, you nerd. Accelerating at being you a nerd. nerd. And why, why would you expect anything less? I was not trying to hook up and find a marriage. Who? So just, just, just saying. Who you were going to marry was the last thing that my family was worried about when I was 12. Like, I didn't have any cousins calling me up being like, you got to marry this old, this old, this older dude. Yeah, but then Maggie one night is like, okay, let me just pray on this shit. Let me just yeah. take a, take a knee or two and <laughs> say a little prayer for you. And one night she's praying and St. Nicholas appears and is like, yeah, you should totally marry this guy named Edmund. Absolutely. What? For, uh, hard, Nicholas? Uh, hard side note, uh, St. Nicholas is Santa Claus. Same person. <laughs> um, so in her story, Santa Claus is giving her advice like, ho, 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 little girl. And what do you want for Christmas? And she's like, a husband. And he's like, well, Edmund Tudor sounds like a ho, 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 bowl full of jelly. Like, what? <laughs> 
no. Oh, no. This is so bad. So You're going to be I, a I grown-ass want... man, woman. <laughs> I wonder the amount of pressure that a nine-year-old is under. Under pressure. Like the king is telling you, I want you to marry this grown-ass man in a few years um, that you've never met, but I'm the king. I'm saying you have a choice. But do you? So, I mean, she can't say no to the king. No. Sometimes I wonder um, if, like, maybe she had a bit of, like, a stress hallucination. A stress-induced... Maybe so. Santa Claus or hallucination. Or maybe it's a brainwash situation where her mom was like, you better see a saint tonight. Now. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that's what happened. I don't know. A lot of people actually disagree about if any of this ever happened. Like, maybe Henry never actually asked her for her consent. Because, I mean, kings could just make a marriage agreement and not ask anybody's opinion on it, you know? He wouldn't ask a little girl her thoughts, so. I don't know. Which, again, she was under pressure. So much pressure! I know, and... Now we're not saying that she didn't have some sort of divine intervention at the time. Maybe. Hard maybe. Hard 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 maybe. maybe. I don't Um, know. But it also seems like that she was just a little girl who went under too much pressure. And we don't know what her mom was telling her or what she was demanding of her or any of her other family members. So it's totally possible that she has this built up shit saint story in her mind to help her cope with this pressure and the pressure of the king basically demanding you as a nine-year-old to marry a 22 year old two-year-old man too soon oh yeah and like soon like you're nine but i expect you to be married by the time you're 12 like oh also Side note, because of this story and because of the only surviving portrait of her that still exists, people often view her as an overly pious person. Uh, Like if you've read the Philippa Gregory book about her, which I have, and I really liked it. It was good, but it's not, it's not real. Um, But in that, they also paint her as just like overly, overly, overly pious with this story and this portrait that we'll put in the show notes where she looks like a nun. If her financial records can be believed, she probably wasn't super over... Like, she was probably pious because at the time, everyone was. Who wasn't? Yeah. Yeah. People like to put in their heads that she tried to live as a nun her whole life and was, like, forced into these marriages and stuff. But, like, one of the things about nuns is they take a vow of um, poverty, This bitch spent so much money on clothes. This bitch spent so much money on wine. She liked to dress fine and drink wine. And girl... I mean, I'm not mad mm, at it. I'm not mad at it either. But it's just just a really, really common misconception of her in pop culture is that she is just this super, super pious woman. And a lot of it stems from that, oh, she saw... She talked to a saint, or she thought she talked to a saint when she was a little girl... And that seems to be maybe um, inflated in popular culture more than it actually, more pious than she actually was. Anyway, so that's, that's back, my little, another little rabbit hole I went down. So back to baby Maggie. So mm-hmm. she tells the king, yes, I'll marry your brother Edmund Tudor. And uh, this shit oh. gets wild, so wild that we need to top off our drinks, gal. Yes, so we absolutely do. So we'll be right back. Yeah, be right back. <laughs> so we're back <laughs> and we're back yes all right so let's learn a little bit about the 22 year old that just got engaged to the nine-year-old shall we edmund tudor oh. nathan tell us about him so we already mentioned that his mom was the dowager queen of england and a france princess uh, that's france princess. Princess. um yeah if you thank, don't you. Know thank, french, you for, thank you thank you for thank you for clarifying <laughs> <laughs> if you don't speak the perfect French that Nathan obviously parlays. Uh, 
<laughs> Name is Catherine Valois, and that his dad was some rando. He was the eldest of two boys, Edmund and Jasper. When his mom died, their older half-brother, Henry VI, brought them into court. He was like, look, I... Like we mentioned earlier, like, he didn't have a whole lot of other, like, close family. So he's like, I got these brothers. I'm gonna bring them into court, make sure they have good education, make sure they're raised right. And Edmund was named the Earl of Richmond at the age 19. Not an un match for our Maggie. And the two the boys, super tight with their half-brother, the king. So... Even though on paper, Edmund's genealogy is uh, questionable at best to most royals, in practicality, it was a good marriage because he was close to the king. Also, Margaret and Edmund don't seem to be related, which is kind of nice because if Margaret was related to Catherine Valois, it would be super duper distantly, but... (sighs) <sighs> they weren't related to the family, so yay, no incest. Yay! I know it seems yay. like the bar is on the floor, um, but it is. they're, like, because, <laughs> I mean, unless this is, you are brand new to Queen's Podcast, you know that, like, all the time in these royal marriages, cousin marrying cousin, it seems like they spread the genes around, maybe yeah, not Yeah, if you're cousins. not fucking your cousin, you're not doing something right. You gotta fuck your yeah. cousin if you're gonna make anything. If you're not your fucking your cousin, you're not doing something. No, if you're not fucking your cousin, you are doing something. What we're trying to say <laughs> is you got your cousins, and then you got your first cousins. Anyway. Um, <laughs> now, for the nobility, it wasn't all that strange for girls this young to get married And even go live with their husbands. Though I do like to dispel a popular rumor or a popular misconception. Um, A lot of people believe that was like for everybody in this time. This girls marrying at 12 was specific to the nobility. Like if you were just like some farmer's daughter, you probably got married at like 16, 18. Um, This young was different for the nobility because they needed to make those alliances. However, barf. barf. Yes, absolutely. However, in the cases of girls marrying, getting married off when they're 12, I hate everything we're about to talk about. It was super, super frowned upon to consummate the marriage, which means, you know, to have sex, to sleep together. It was super, super, it wasn't illegal to sleep with your 12 year old bride, but it was basically, it it was, it should be, it should be. It was an unwritten rule that you wait for them to grow up first. Like, yes, we've gotten married to strengthen the alliances between our families, but I'm going to wait for you. I I was done growing at 12. I'm the height that I was at 12. But a lot of people aren't. Like, um, so it's like, I'm going to wait for you to hit your final growth spurt. I'm going to wait for you to grow up a bit so i want you to just take this bit of information this little nugget of knowledge put it in your back pocket bloop, and um it might come up again later maybe so typically if a girl was engaged that young she'd go live with the groom's closest female relative until she was old enough To consummate the marriage, but (laughs) these Tudor boys, uh, they didn't have any female relatives. Yeah. (laughs) So she got to stay with her mom and her mom's family for a wee bit longer. Which is nice. Which actually, I'm just thinking about, like, maybe if they, uh, if the Tudors had had some female relatives, things would have gone differently for Margaret and the ickiness we're going to get to in a minute. Anyway. So let's fast forward. It's a couple years later, and it's now 1455, and Margaret is 12. (laughs) She's not nine, so it's still awful. And she's ready to get married at 12. Okay, I hate it here. (laughs) Do better, Jerry. Do better. Do better. I don't know. (laughs) 
find anything about their wedding except that it took place in November. And then, like, immediately after, Edmund was sent to go hold up Lancastrian forces in Wales because we are now officially in the time of English history called The The War War of of the the Roses. Roses. This is probably one of, in, like, my top three favorite historical time periods. I love The Wars of the Roses because it is... It is just soap opera level shit. Oh, yes. And we've talked about the War of the Roses a lot on this show. But if you're just joining us, here's a real quick summary on what is and what is going to happen. Yes. Okay, so we got two factions in the nobility, the upper crust of English society. You got the Lancastrians. This Lancastrians over in this corner, yeah. It's the Lanca- and they've got the red roses. They're dressed in red. Ooh. They are the red roses. These are all the families that are descendant from that guy John of Gaunt that we were talking about earlier. So that is both Henry and Margaret. They are both the king and Maggie B are both in the red Lancastrian corner. So. Nathan, why don't you tell us about the Yorks or the White Roses? Ooh, they are led by this guy named Dick. Um, (laughs) Sorry, uh, Richard. Richard (laughs) of York. Um, (laughs) The Duke, 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 Duke of York. York, uh, York. He he thinks he should be the king because Henry VI is kind of cray. Uh, mm-hmm. mentally unstable. We've yeah. talked about this before. Yeah. Uh, he went into a catatonic state for like a year and a half. Whole rabbit hole. Yeah, <laughs> his grandfather, the guy, that Charles the Sixth of France, also suffered similarly. Remember? Do you remember in those episodes, of the Isabeau yes, Bavaria episodes, like he thought he was made of glass and he thought he was going to yeah, shatter? No, like, he swallowed a piano or something. Yeah, yeah, he thought he swallowed a glass piano and now he's made of glass. So anyway, that is this guy's grandson. So ugh. so we're glossing over this with a high luminescent gloss. Huge um, sparkly lip gloss. simplifying it. <laughs> so TLDR, uh, Maggie and her new hubby are Lancastrians big time. Yes. And they head off to Edmund's castle in Wales to fight for them. Yeah. Okay, but here are where things get gross, and I don't want to talk about this, and so we've kind of like kind of did a little bit of like precursor to this before um but, you know we said that it was legal to marry a 12 year old girl and it was legal to sleep with her but most people didn't edmund tudor was like i break the rules apparently and he uh, he definitely consummated his marriage with margaret beaufort immediately i don't even want to think about it I no. but like I, Think about her as a person. She's away from her mother for the first time ever in her life. There's a war going on. She's 12. She's with this 25-year-old man that I don't think they spent a lot of time together. And also, I don't know what, what was sex education like for these poor girls before they got married? Like, did anybody tell her what was going to happen? I, I don't know. I... I, it honestly Sorry, it honestly makes me want to cry a little bit like that uh her whole situation Ugh. so yeah edmund tudor not at the top of our historical crushes list Mm-mm. Mm-mm. so within a year of marriage she's pregnant she's pregnant what what and it appears that just about everyone except edmund is just like super fucking worried about this little 12 year old who's pregnant with a child. Wait, well, on ah, top of being, that. on top of being only 12, she was a tiny 12 year old to begin with. She was, it was already like, oh, she is small. And so when people found out she was pregnant, I mean, we've talked about so much on this show. Pregnancy and childbirth were dangerous for grown-ass women. It was dangerous for a 30-year-old woman. Her odds at her age and her size, they they outlook not good, as my Magic 8-Ball yeah. would say. Um, yeah. And I don't know. 
something that I kept trying to find out about and just couldn't, like, was anybody talking to her about the dangers? Did she know anything about childbirth? Did she know what was about to happen? Or was she completely she in had, the dark? I, I don't know. I do you, did you find anything about that? It was kept in the dark about the whole thing. Yeah, you think so? She didn't know how dangerous this would be, childbirth yeah. at 12. Um, I think she was scared, obviously. Like, I'm building a human being inside of my it's uncomfortable. baby body. Yeah. It's, it's, it's awfully terrible. Um, oh, you know what it just... made me think of? Um, we talked about, we, we have an episode on Aretha Franklin. Did you ever watch that, the movie about Aretha Franklin with Jennifer Lawrence in it? Yeah. So we know Aretha Franklin had a baby at 12 as well. Um, it made me think of that scene in the movie where they show the pregnant 12 year old and just how like disturb. they only showed it for like two seconds, but it got the point across about how disturbing it is. Just like, oh, it was a death sentence. Like a lot of people just assumed it was a death sentence. Like, oh, this girl, yeah, this girl's going to die. She's, mm, yeah. Uh. Anyway, Ooh. anyway, oh, this is sad. So we have to assume that his family, I mean, her family, is probably pissed at him because, hey, bro, like, this is this unspoken rule that you violated. So what the hell is going on here? Right? You're supposed to wait. You're supposed to give it a little bit of time. No. So her family was quite possibly pissed. But I also kind of wonder if it was like, um, we need more Lancastrians. We're in a civil war. Uh-oh. We need... We need more bodies, essentially. A son between the two of them would have a distant, albeit relevant claim to the throne. So maybe her family... I like to think that her family would have been pissed off, but maybe they also would have been like, okay, but maybe she'll have a son that'll, like, elevate us all. I don't know. Which, again, is still not great. Still gross, but, yeah. Mm. Something else that made us want to barf and cry is if a man had a child with a woman and the woman died, if she owned any lands, he had a right to those lands and income until that child was, quote unquote, an adult, a.k.a. Yeah. 12. <laughs> no, I think I actually, you know what? You could get married at 12. You could be forced into a marriage at 12. But you didn't come into your own incomes until you were 18. What a load of misogynistic bullshit. Well, (laughs) that wasn't just necessarily for women. It was for women and men. But, like, um, yes. Uh, What a load of bullshit. Absolutely. Yeah, super problematic. Yeah, and so Maggie had a lot of land. She had a lot of land. She had a lot of money. She had a lot more of land and money than Edmund. So, yeah, so if she had a <clears throat> if she had died but had a kid that survived, Edmund would be the wealthy man, yeah. right? Like yeah. so if she got pregnant, had a child, then, you know, it would go to her son, her wealthiest son. Yeah. And I'm not saying I'm not saying I'm just saying. I'm not saying that I think Edmund Tudor had this in mind. But I I'm already predisposed to not like him very much. <laughs> So, so I'm just like, mm, I'm happy he's not in this story long. Spoiler alert! Yay! So in October 1556, Edmund was taken hostage by some Yorkists in South Wales. Mm-hmm. And what happened next is a little unclear. But what we read, he either got sick while being imprisoned and just died. He was released but was too sick to travel and died nearby. Or he was released, traveled back home, and died. Either way, Eddie T, dead, gone, out of the picture. He may have even died on their first anniversary. Margaret's wedding. Yeah, they may, he may have died on their first anniversary. He died, It was definitely the same month. But some people, like, dispute, like, the actual date. But it was quite possibly on their wedding anniversary. Oof. Oof, yeah. So now Maggie is not only a heavily pregnant 12 or 13-year-old. She's 13 at this point. You know, so that makes it better. She's also a widow. In a country where she only knows one other person. In a country where her husband 
has been like taken hostage and maybe killed or maybe like just who she is like just worried can you feel the anxiety coming off of her from the, like can you imagine can you imagine i cannot she's scared shitless she's freaking so out she and she's up, pregnant yeah. and she's a baby just i just feel the anxiety coming off of her in this right story. so she's like i need to change my scenery i need to travel i need to get out and she decides to do just that yeah. but she's huge and pregnant yeah and she's so tiny that travel on a horse while pregnant, right. could be a little bit uncomfortable. Right. Um, Even if it's just, like, to a couple of towns over, back then that took hours on a horse. When yeah. You're, yeah. Ugh. So she's going to her friend Jasper Tudor's castle in Pembroke Castle, and thankfully Jasper welcomes her, hires a new staff of midwives, and is like, hey, hey, baby girl, just hang out here. We're going to have a good time. You're going to be okay. <laughs> this house is a lot... Yeah, it's a lot further away from the fighting. Yeah, Jasper had really loved his brother. The, the two of them were very, very tight. So he kind of felt like a moral responsibility for Margaret. And it seems like he really went out of his way to make her comfortable. Even though, like, I bet he was also sort of like, oh, she's going to die here, isn't she? Like, I think that was like, everybody was like, oh, this little girl's gonna die. God damn it. Like, ugh. Yeah. So, they're at Pembroke Castle on January 28th, 1457. She gave birth to a little boy. Baby boy, you've been on my mind for the film of Regency. <laughs> and we don't have any details, but we do know it wasn't an easy delivery. Mm-hmm. She was... It she was a baby. Later... The priest dude that was there said, it's a miracle that someone of, quote unquote, so little of personages should survive childbirth. (sighs) Um, That means she was a child and should not be giving birth to a child. You know what? Maybe a child should not be in childbirth. Yeah. You know, you might be onto something there. No. Apparently the midwives all thought that both her and the baby were going to die. That's how long it went on, and that's how icky it was. But spoiler, she didn't die, and baby didn't die. (laughs) After a long, dangerous birth, a very healthy baby boy was born. And apparently when Edmund was alive, she was told that if they had a baby boy, they'd be naming it Owen after his dad. But Edmund wasn't alive, so... She named him Henry after King Henry the Sixth. I love, I love that she's just like fuck that. Um, this was actually a pretty ballsy move because um, yeah. the Wars of the Roses is, is like raging on, and the Yorkists are killing Lancastrians left, right, and center. So if she would have named her baby Owen, maybe she could, like, later kind of deny, if she needed to, like, deny, like, how close they were to the Lancastrian throne. But this baby could be considered second in line to the throne after Henry VI's own son. And so she's saying, I want people to remember who we are and what side we're on. We are Lancastrian ride or die fuck yeah remember that and so i i think that's a little bit of a punk rock movement from from Uh, maggie b absolutely so and y'all maggie was obsessed with this baby which (laughs) pretty normal pretty normal for new moms but fiercely protected which like she kind of had to be, yeah, she kind of had to be at the time because your baby might get killed if you don't protect him. Um, there's pretty much all the Yorkists around trying to hope that something would happen. Yes. This little baby that just, whoops, she dropped him down the flight of cathedral Oops, stairs. Oops, he, he's oh, a baby no. and he died from whatever illness that babies die from all the time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Also, maybe she had some kind of intuition that she wouldn't have any more children. Um, birth wrecked her. Yeah. She, it fucked her up bad. And spoiler alert, she married again, but she 
like, and her next marriage, she was in, like, prime baby-making years. She never made any more babies. This is the only baby she ever had. And later in her life, she would uh, say things about how she believed it was because of how she believed that her birth with Henry made her completely unable to have children. So maybe in her mind, she knew, I got one shot. I got one shot at this motherhood shit, and I'm going to put all my eggs in this fucking basket. You know what I mean? She's on maternity leave. Yeah. (laughs) She's a high-ranking noble. She's been out and about for about two months. And then Jasper comes to her and is like, look, we need allies. You've got to get remarried. And for the sake of the family, for Henry's protection, we need an alliance. Yeah. And of course, she's like, Henry, yes, of course, I'll save myself. Yes, yes, whatever for my baby. So two months after she's given birth, two months, they traveled to meet the Duke of Buckingham. Um, the Duke of Buckingham was super rich, super powerful, and also... Super, super, super Lancastrian. And he had um, his first son already been married off. So she's not going to inherit the Duke of Buckingham. Like, the du- she's never going to be a Duchess of Buckingham, probably. But he's got a second son, a guy named Henry Stafford, who we'll just call Stafford because there's already another Henry in the story. And I, huh. yeah. Her second son, Henry Stafford, was single and ready to mingle. And he was probably about 30 years old, and Maggie was like 15, Ugh. so half the age, which still doesn't make it well. Um, so Husband number three, yeah. we're 15. Ed- <clears throat> oh, this is bad. So unlike Edmund, she and Stafford were related and had to get a papal dispensation because they were both descendants of... John of Gaunt and Cap Swinford. So, guys, this family loved their incest. I'm a da popa. I give the dispensations. Marry your cousin. Marry your cousin. <laughs> Mwah. Chef's kiss. Italian hand. Um, <laughs> they were given an estate in northern England and settled in. And it seems like this was a happy marriage. Like... From all accounts, it seems like they got along. Like, isn't that nice? That's nice, maybe? Question mark. I mean, we're not sure if Henry went with them or if he stayed in Wales. Um, He was the ward of his uncle at the time. So we hope he stayed with her, but it's... But it kind of seems like the next two years of her life was chill. Which is nice, because spoiler alert... That's not the case for a whole lot of parts of her life. But for the next, like, couple of years, she and Stafford, they traveled, they spent time with family, they did, like, sports, they did, like, hunting and, like, tennis, and, like, they just seemed to have a lot in common, and they got along, and everyone seems happy. So I love that she had a couple of years of chill happiness. Until 1460, when the War of the Roses got to turn up to full blast. And Margaret's husband, father-in-law, and stepdad were all in battles at the time fighting, which had to have been stressful for her. But up to this point, the Lancastrians had been winning, things are going their way, everything's great, until they weren't. Until they weren't. Her her father-in-law and her stepdad died in battle. Which was a huge blow to the family. And now Maggie is on the losing side. She's no longer winning all these battles. And now there's a new king, Edward IV, a Yorkist. He just so happens to be king. I have to imagine that her mind went straight to her son. Like, the old King Henry has been deposed. And so she's probably thinking, if she's anything like me, whenever I'm in a stressful situation, I go first and foremost to worst case scenario. Like, what does this mean for my son? He is named after a king who has now been deposed. Um, I I just, but she's like going through like, she's doom scrolling in her mind. Are they going to take him away? Are they going to take him hostage? Are they going to kill him? I, my stomach is in knots just thinking about it, you know? Maggie's husband made a choice that we think makes a lot of sense. So he went to the king and was like, hey, man, my bad. You know, me and my wife, we're, we're going to accept you as king. And 
Because of that, Maggie got to keep a lot of her lands. She got to keep a lot of her money. And, you know, she got to keep the peace. I love this for her. We are all compromising. Sometimes a bit of compromise is important. But um, I don't know about you. I couldn't find anything about how she took the news of, like, we're, we're Yorkist now. Um, yeah, not good. Yeah, I have to imagine that she was a bit annoyed, though I understand why her husband made the choices he made. But it turns out that Edward IV is kind of an okay guy. But um, in my mind, I'm still just pic- picturing her being like, are you fucking serious? I hate this. I hate everything about this. And I, But she's not dumb. So surely she saw the merits of of making friends with the new king, like accepting it. But I don't know. We, we just don't know. Oh, yeah. No. He noped the fuck out to Scotland and then noped the fuck out to France. And by proxy, this made her son look bad in the eyes of the new king. It's like there are two tutors and one of them is the enemy. What's his nephew going to be like? Is he Is he going to grow up and be like his uncle or not? Yeah. Can you imagine the anxiety this would have put on Margaret though. Like I, it got even worse when the new King was like, I have eyes on your son all the time. And he forces Margaret to put her son into a wardship of this guy who was a staunch, staunch Yorkist, a guy named William Herbert. And it wasn't uncommon back then to like put your kids into wardships. It, it, it makes me think it's giving me um, in game of Thrones, Theon with the, yeah, with the Starks. It's giving me that it's very, very similar, but it still would have been stressful for her. Like, look, your son is in the house of one of my friends. You make one wrong step. You fuck around for a second And you're going to find out, you know? Right. And so obviously Margaret's going to act right. But then the new king took Henry's title, the Earl of Richmond, and gave it to his own brother. Mm. And that's where, like, Margaret's like, excuse me, Mm. what the fuck? Mm -mm. And obviously she couldn't do anything in the moment, but this shit lit a fire under her ass and she made it her life's work to make sure that her son never ever had something that was rightfully taken away from him ever again and this is what we call foreshadowing (laughs) and that's where we're gonna leave it for today um nathan i will see you in a couple of weeks to hear the rest of this story Let's get it to Margaret Beaufort. Ooh! Thanks for listening, guys. Cheers, bitches!